Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just one moment here. If a couple of you could confirm that you can hear my voice coming through in the chat box, that would be wonderful. It's always just good to get a quick confirmation that our audio is coming through clearly. Oh, loud and clear. Yes. All right. Wonderful. And I, it's also a good test to make sure the chat box is function, functioning as it should. Great. All right. Thank you all. All right. I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone, to today's USAID Stakeholder Community Meeting on Mitigating the Impacts of COVID-19 on Food, Nutrition, and Water Security. My name is Julie McCarty, and I am with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security with the Center for Nutrition, and I am your webinar host today. We're really excited to have over 1,400 registrants for this conversation, plus presenters from Bangladesh, Nepal, and Kenya, in addition to the U.S. But before we get started, I would like to just quickly orient you to the BlueJeans platform that we're using today. It's a somewhat new platform for us as well. And so at the bottom of your screen, you will see a slider bar right underneath the speaker spaces. And dragging the slider left and right will make either the presenter or the slides bigger. And you can choose the view that's most convenient for you. It's a pretty cool feature. To turn on closed captioning, please click on the CC box on the left side of your screen. And in the right hand sidebar menu, you will see two ways to communicate, a chat button and a Q&A button. Please use the chat stream to introduce yourselves, communicate with your fellow attendees, and share links to any resources that are relevant to the discussion today. And please, please use the Q&A feature to submit questions for the presenters. We'll answer as many questions as we can today after the panel discussion. And for those that we can't get to, we promise to read all submitted questions and use them as inputs for future discussions. So again, please use the Q&A feature for your questions for the panelists. And lastly, we are recording this webinar and we will email the recording to everyone who registered. All right, next I would like to briefly go over the agenda for today. First up, we will have an introduction by Trey Hicks, who is the assistant to the administrator with the USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. And next up will be Greg Collins, deputy assistant administrator and USAID resilience coordinator with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and he will cover analysis and evidence of impact. And then Greg will moderate a panel featuring four voices from the field, and we're really excited to have a great panel with us today. After the panel, we will have some questions and answers from the audience, both some pre-submitted questions and some that come in during this webinar. Then we'll have some reflections on the panel from Max Primorak, who is Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, and finally, some closing thoughts from Maura Berry, Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. So to kick things off, I would like to introduce Trey Hicks, who is Assistant to the Administrator for the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance at USAID and the alter ego for the Associate Administrator for Relief, Response and Resilience. So I would like to hand the reins over to Trey. All right, thanks, Julie, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're uh, calling in from. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so, as we all know, the negative impacts of COVID-19 on already vulnerable communities cannot be overstated. Um, the impact is across the board. It's on health, food security, nutrition, uh, water sanitation and hygiene or wash, uh, protection of women and girls, um, these are both short and long-term priorities that the impact is being felt right now. And unfortunately, it will be felt for years to come. Um, FuseNet projects about 23 million additional people will experience crisis levels of hunger and require emergency food assistance this year as a result of COVID-19, bringing the total in need up to 113 million. More broadly, IFPRI projects a rise in poverty of more than 100 million people with a concurrent rise in hunger and food insecurity. This is in addition to the 820 million already living in poverty and hunger. Most of this increase 
is uh, food insecurity will be concentrated in places where Feed the Future already works, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Greg will share how this uh, will play out at a country level in next after I'm done. Um, this harrowing finding demonstrates a loss of seven years of progress in helping people feed themselves. As these projections show, if we don't act now, we risk, we risk several things, increased mortality, um, lost potential. In other words, since poor nutrition early in life will result in increased child mortality, it's lost potential of an entire generation. Um, further increases in humanitarian need and cost, increased unrest and instability, which we saw in the 2007-2008 food crises. This is particularly poignant as we recognize Feed the Future's 10th year anniversary this year. Um, there's going to be slow recovery in agriculture and food systems that are majorly damaged right now. This will affect the economic base upon which many countries look to build. And finally, the reversal of years of hard-won progress. In addition, we have already seen political unrest along with violence against people thought to be spreading the virus, as well as those sickened by it. Non-state actors such as terrorist groups or violent extremist organizations and transnational organized criminal networks, they're taking advantage of overwhelmed governments. This is an example of how a public health crisis could extend into other areas of concern for USAID. USAID is pivoting to respond to the new political and economic reality shaped by the pandemic. One way we are doing this is by reassessing needs and analyzing potential scenarios that might require us to reprioritize resources or to do business differently. Bottom line is we need a full spectrum response now and in the post COVID world or the current COVID world that works more effectively across sectors and integrates humanitarian development and conflict programming. To that end, I'm extremely proud to say that USAID has made structural changes internally to ensure that the agency's humanitarian development and conflict mitigation efforts are complementary and working in tandem to address short and long-term impacts of COVID. Since we last convened in, I think, late April, the agency has stood up the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, or BHA, and the Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization, or CPS. And with the earlier transformation of the Bureau for Food Security to the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, or RFS, we have completed what we call the R3 family of bureaus, which stands for Relief, Response, and Resilience. This monumental shift in the agency structure allows all three of our bureaus to collaborate in a more purposeful, coordinated, and effective way, and ultimately better allows us to support our partner countries in their journey to self-reliance. In the face of the current pandemic, the R3 family is not only working to mitigate immediate health impacts, but also providing much needed humanitarian assistance and working to prevent a health crisis from becoming a worsening food and livelihood crisis. Our humanitarian assistance is particular, um, in particular is addressing needs related to COVID-19 in 42 countries where we provide emergency health, wash, protection, and food assistance interventions. More broadly, we are adjusting existing programs and priority areas to respond and, and have speed recovery. Our efforts are focused on smart policy responses, helping governments make informed decisions, supporting small businesses and helping them pivot away uh, their business models and access capital and operate safely, stabilizing supplies and prices, um, helping farmers not miss a growing season, and sharing critical messaging stopping the spread of virus and helping production going and markets keep, keep, open, uh, keep open. Supplementing existing emergency food assistance and protecting food security gains by temporarily pivoting development activities. So in conclusion, clearly COVID-19 is changing both needs and how we deliver assistance from humanitarian to development. I'm looking forward to the discussion today as we learn from you, our partners, how you are rising to meet the challenges and pivoting your own programming. And while current projections of COVID-19's impacts are serious, and we'll hear a bit more on new findings from Greg next, I'm hopeful our current efforts will be bolstered and accelerated by our new R3 structure. Thank you. Julie? Thank you so much, Trey. 
All right, next up, I would like to introduce Greg Collins, who is Deputy Assistant Administrator and USAID Resilience Coordinator with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Greg? Great, thanks, Julian. Is my audio and video working correctly? Yes, I can see you clearly. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Julie, and thanks, Ray, for that uh, sort of quick uh, intro to the issues at hand. I'm going to dive a little deeper into the more recent analysis that unpacks some of the high-level statistics that Trey, uh, that Trey outlined. Uh, and then that's really setting the stage for the, the meat of the conversation here today, which is this great panel we've assembled from across the globe to talk about how they're pivoting actions to, to deal with this historic, historical uh, crisis. Uh, next slide, Julie. Next slide, please. Great. So I mean, this is just a quick overview of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk a little bit about the impacts on hunger and poverty. The big takeaway from the latest data, go back one slide, please. The big takeaway from uh, the, the <clears throat> latest data is that the, uh, the impacts are projected to persist much longer than we initially thought. And I'll get into some, some findings from the recent State of Food Insecurity 2020 report, which was released uh, a couple of weeks ago that really uh, sort of uh, illustrate that in a very powerful way. Unsurprisingly, inequality will, is also projected to increase. And I think many of you will have seen uh, the Lanson article that came out on Monday that put numbers to the projections around uh, the number of kids that are projected to be uh, acutely malnourished or wasted as a result uh, of, of the mitigation efforts uh, and also uh, stresses on the health system. So we'll speak to that a little bit. And then finally, I'm going to touch on the critical role that water sanitation and hygiene play as a linchpin, both for stopping the spread of COVID-19, but also, really importantly, for enabling economic recovery. And I, I'm going to share some examples of uh, some risk to insolvency amongst WASH service providers that are very concerning, uh, that are sort of mirror some of the challenges uh, we have on the food security side uh, related to stresses uh, on small and medium-sized enterprise. Next slide, please. So this slide lays out the various ways in which efforts to stop the spread of the virus are impacting on food security around the globe. They're wide ranging, they're causally intertwined, and they have far reaching implications for local food supply, for local food prices, markets, as well as small and medium sized enterprises, people's livelihoods, incomes, and their ability to produce and purchase food. One primary driver there at the top is the loss of jobs and livelihoods. Uh, and that really is not due to COVID-19 itself, but the restrictions that have been in place, uh, market closures, restrictions on the movement of people and goods. Uh, I already talked about this at the last community meeting, but something that's hugely concerning is the impact, because this is a global event, the impact this is having on remittances in places like Nigeria, Somalia, Haiti, that really depend on remittances in times of need, are experiencing a huge decline globally, $110 billion decline. And in Africa, some of the more recent estimates uh, are suggesting up to a 50% decline in remittances. That's deeply concerning. The production of major food crops is expected to remain above average in 2020, but the pandemic has already created disruptions along food chains and further disruptions could well lead to local food uh, price spikes. In fact, we're already seeing this uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I introduce some data uh, from Nigeria. Um, Trey alluded to this as well. Um, these logistic constraints could also disrupt the next planting season with potentially severe consequences downstream. So another thing we're deeply concerned about. And I think uh, it's not lost on any of us that this is all happening on top of a range of other shocks and stresses to East Africa, and even some of the Middle East and the locust threat, conflict, projections of drought. So this is the ultimate covariate shock in terms of the breadth of its reach, but it's becoming the ultimate compound shock as well as it layers in on other shocks and stresses. This both multiplies the impacts on people's well-being and food security, but COVID-19 and the restrictions on movement are also hampering the ability to effectively mitigate uh, other shocks and stresses, be it locust, drought, or conflict. I, you see on here also the threat to meet small and medium-sized enterprises that I alluded to earlier. Really important to, to, to underscore 
point because they're centrally implicated in the countries we're most con concerned about. In fact, very much like they are here in the United States. Why? If we look at Africa alone, 80% of livelihoods are tied in one way or another to these small and medium-sized enterprises in the food system. 80% of food in Africa flows through these small and, and medium-sized enterprises in the food system. So the takeaway there is simple. If they fail, the food system will fail. If they fail to recover quickly, the food system will fail to recover quickly. So all of this highlights the need for an urgent and integrated humanitarian and development response to, as Trey said, prevent a health crisis from becoming an even greater food crisis. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, here are the latest estimates um, from June onward, looking at descents into poverty and chronic hunger. And you see the estimates still vary. In fact, many institutions are putting out different scenarios and ranges. But you'll see this clustering uh, of people descending into poverty, an additional about 100 million people. Similar in terms of people descending into chronic hunger, people who weren't experiencing chronic hunger descending into chronic hunger about 80 to uh, 100 million people. And as Trey noted earlier, we also estimate that the number of people likely to experience crisis levels of hunger and in need of emergency assistance will increase by 25% or 23 million people. So the way to think about the relationship between that 23 million people at crisis levels of hunger and the numbers I'm presenting here is that many of those 23 million were already poor and food insecure, and now they've been pushed into crisis levels of hunger. And even greater number of people who weren't poor and food insecure are now also pushed into poverty and food insecurity. So this is deeply concerning because as, as Trey noted, this not only means backsliding on years of progress, but if unaddressed or compounded by other shocks and stresses, this larger group who descended into poverty and food insecurity could be pushed and backslide further to crisis levels of hunger in the future. In other words, the current forecast for humanitarian need is the tip of the iceberg. And Trey alluded to this as well, it's not lost at all on us that where grievances exist, an increase in poverty of hunger at this scale can be a tipping point for social and political unrest. Next slide. These are a little bit uh, difficult to see, but these are regional uh, graphs of the projections from the state of food insecurity analysis that I mentioned earlier. They were updated in June. The green line shows the pre-COVID estimate or trajectory. The yellow, orange, and red lines show three different scenarios for COVID impacts in order of severity, red being the most severe. A couple of takeaways here. One, the impacts are sustained above pre-COVID estimates, even looking out to 2030. If you look at the dots at the far right of the graph, those are the estimates for 2030. These are long-term impacts that are predicted to persist. Second, and very notable, uh, the, the graph on the left is South Asia, the graph on the right is Sub-Saharan Africa, and there's a big difference here. In Asia, we see a sharp increase in, in chronic hunger, but a quick rebound and a steady decline. In sub-Saharan Africa, there isn't a projected rebound, and the impacts of COVID-19 are projected to accelerate an already, already uh, deeply concerning trend of growing chronic hunger. Next slide. I also want to quickly highlight or underscore an important point that um, seems obvious, but it's often forgotten, so worth highlighting. Higher income countries are projected to experience higher rates of COVID-19 cases and deaths than lower income countries. But the projected increases we're talking about here in terms of poverty, food insecurity, are exponentially greater in low income countries. Very simple, a shallow tipping point. And I think as many of you will have likely seen reports coming out from uh, groups like Oxfam and others are raising the, alarming, uh, are raising the alarm that deaths from hunger leading to starvation could well outstrip deaths from the disease itself. It's also important to realize that this is impacting not only urban areas, but rural areas as well. And even where the percentage decline in the poverty of food security may be greater in urban areas, the, ge the geographic, geographic distribution of populations means in many countries, in fact, most countries, the absolute number of additional people descending into poverty and food insecurity is greater in your rural areas than, than in urban areas. 
Next, I'm going to walk through impacts uh, from Nigeria, if you can proceed to the next slide, based on modeling and recent phone survey data from the World Bank. And the reason I highlight uh, Nigeria here is not to talk specifically about Nigeria, but really to signal the pivot from these big numbers that are hard to wrap our heads around to these country-specific analyses that are allowing us to form actionable recommendations and responses. It also points out that this is unfolding differently uh, in countries around the world. So most of you will know that Nigeria had high levels of acute and chronic food insecurity well before COVID-19. Nigeria also faced an array of other shocks and stresses, so that compound issue that I spoke to earlier. Uh, there has been significant impact on the economy from de decrease in oil prices and revenue, and food prices are rising because of border closures and transport restrictions, that local food price spike I was talking about earlier. Between April and June, the share of households going back to work increased in both urban and rural areas, reflecting the easing of lockdown measures, and that's really good news. However, 40% of households are still not working, and income from non-farm households, businesses remain precarious. So again, persistent impacts. It's not just about taking down the restrictions on movement. These impacts are gonna last for quite some time. And as a result, the food security situation in Nigeria has actually substantially worsened since the pandemic started. From the most recent survey, 30% of households are experiencing severe food insecurity and 77% nationally experiencing moderate food security. Next slide. So quickly touching on the nutritional impact that I, that I flagged earlier, um, the food security and hunger uh, issues I outlined in the preceding slides are impacting nutrition for sure, but it's really important to underscore the fact that COVID-19 is simultaneously disrupting every system and sector that impact nutrition, including health systems, including food systems. As noted earlier, when incomes drop, people can no longer afford nutritious foods. Producers and sellers of nutritious foods, those SMEs that I talked about earlier, are struggling to stay afloat. Health systems are also overwhelmed and families are more reluctant to access needed health care with consequences for health generally and nutrition specifically. I mentioned earlier that uh, The Lancet had published an article on Monday that projects that all of this will result in an additional 6.7 million children suffering from wasting this year. In turn, it's projected that this will result in an additional 130,000 child deaths, so daunting, and half of those deaths are projected to be in Africa. It's also important to note that this is just the first analysis we've done on looking at nutritional impacts. We've got initial analysis coming out in August, looking at low birth weight, stunting, as well as decreases in breastfeeding and diet quality. So a lot more to, to look at in terms of nutrition. Now moving to water and sanitation slide. Next slide, please. Can we move to the water slide, please? Yeah, sorry, Greg, um, there's a person with a small delay. Okay, thank you. Uh, now moving on to water sanitation hygiene. As I highlighted at the front end, uh, we all know that access to critical wash services were a significant challenge to uh, to uh, uh, overcome before COVID-19. Uh, and as also noted earlier, WASH is both a linchpin for prevention and recovery. Uh, alongside social distancing, hand washing is a primary layer of defense against COVID-19. And if we acknowledge the realities of a timeline for getting a yet to be developed vaccine to the places we work, it's gonna be a primary layer of defense for the foreseeable future. We also know that reliable water supplies and hand washing are also needed to safely reopen economies. And herein lies one of the many vicious cycles and a particularly vicious cycle caused by COVID-19. And it's really been where we begin to connect the dots with the front end of the analysis that I was talking about with, with WASH. So the loss of livelihoods and income I described earlier is also putting a strain on people's ability to access WASH services. And through that, putting a strain on WASH service providers. Simply put, people can no longer afford to pay. Temporary measures uh, continue, uh, that, that uh, continue providing services, such as mandates, and I'll talk about one in Kenya uh, in just a minute. These mandates to provide free water, they're temporary. They can't be sustained. Many service, provider, service providers now risk insolvency, which, if realized, 
would lead to broader and systemic declines in access to water and sanitation. And if access rates further decline, it will significantly impact the, our ability to safely reopen economies and prevent COVID-19 transmission. And in turn, this will compound the economic shock. So you see here this vicious cycle of each, each uh, failure causing another failure. Let's go ahead and look at this in specific countries. Next slide. Great, so here we're looking at Kenya and India. Uh, in Kenya, the government directed water not be shut off due to non-payment. Well, it's critical to sustain essential water service during the pandemic, and we all believe that to be true. A recent survey found service providers are now only able to collect 30% of their usual revenue. We'll hear more about this uh, in detail from Euphrasia, who's joining us from Kenya. But the top line message is that this has a profound effect on basic operations of service providers, including their ability to pay, pay for electricity, procure needed chlorine supplies, and retain personnel. So the same issues that small and medium-sized enterprises in the food system are facing are being faced here. Similarly, uh, we, if we look at India and sanitation purposes there, we, we know that India has the highest uh, rate of open defecation in the world, and there had been considerable progress being made on that front prior to COVID-19. But now sanitation enterprises report a revenue loss of over 50% as a result of COVID-19. And this is creating a very real possibility of backsliding all the progress that's been made. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Before we move to the panel, which is, is, is really what we, we, we wanted to create space for today, is to hear from implementers on the ground and the actions they're taking to, to, to rise to this enormous challenge. I do want to reflect for a minute on these numbers and scenarios. This is very sobering. Uh, the transit statistics are uh, hard to wrap our heads around. And make no mistake, they're significant and they're going to be with us for quite some time. But we also know that these projections, these revised projections and trajectories, they are not destiny. We have the ability to change their trajectory if we act now and if we act collectively across sectors and across humanitarian and development spheres. We also clearly need to be thinking about the impacts not only as a six to 12 month issue, but as a three, five, 10 year or longer issue. Together as a community, uh, these uh, multiple communities in embracing and coming together here today, we've risen to the challenge time and time again. I think the big difference now, if we look at Feed the Future and Water for the World, uh, our multi-sector nutrition efforts, the difference now is we have proven models and so, we would need to build on lessons learned from these proven models as we build back in the wake of COVID-19 and its impacts. I've also been hugely encouraged by the stories we're hearing from around the world, from our missions, from our partners, from communities working together to respond to, respond to these impacts uh, at, this historic, uh, uh, at this historic time. And truly, truly honored to have a handful of those partners here today to share what they're learning as they adapt and respond uh, on the ground. Uh, so let me go ahead and get started um, with the panel. They, uh, this group of four uh, come from uh, implementing partners uh, from across different sectors. Each will provide a brief overview of how they're responding to COVID-19 and share some of the lessons they're learning. Their names and affiliations are shown here, but I'll introduce each prior to asking them to speak. And then once we're through the short presentations, we'll then move to a question and answer period Please send questions through the Q&A function uh, uh, that Julie described at, at the outset of this, and we'll try to get through as many as we can, including uh, some questions that were submitted prior to the event. So let's get started. Our first presentation will be uh, from Euphrasia Luseka in Kenya. She's a water governance and policy specialist with DAI. And Euphrasia, thrilled to have you here. Over to you. Thank you very much. My name is Ifri Salisak, as you've heard. I'm a water governance specialist, and today I will be speaking to you about water governance and COVID-19 response in the country. Now, uh, let's move to the next slide. In my country, Kenya, we are basically uh, 47 million people. Uh, up to now, we have approximately 19,000 cases of COVID-19. And the first case was announced in uh, 13th March 2020, and thereafter we've been trying to contain the disease through various government uh, protocols. 
Um, in terms of COVID-19 um, impact in the water in the water sector, we're seeing some very interesting trends. And the first trend is the fact that um, we are seeing a shift in water demands. And this is quite a good thing uh, because and this actually for the water demand patterns are shifting, especially in the household levels, as well as the domestic connections. And this is a good thing for us because it means that we're having more people using safe uh, water. And then at the same time, we are also seeing a challenge with regards to water affordability. Now, with issues to do with water affordability that are being experienced most in the rural uh, areas as well as in the urban areas, in areas where we have um, informal settlements, we are having users who are willing to pay uh, who are willing to pay for safe water, but at the same time they cannot be able to afford it. In the WSP perspective, and that generally means water service providers, we're having another uh, interesting trend where the challenge is on the human resources management. Now, here the biggest challenge uh, is this: that the water sector is quite a labor intensive sector but at the same time um, COVID-19 has also been pronounced as an occupational disease. So how do we manage the staff during this period? We're also seeing some interesting trends in terms of capital expenditures and operational expenditures. As we had seen in the previous uh, slide, um, cap capital expenditures are basically being deferred to investments in, uh, in, in emergency response, especially in the health sector. So it's affecting our uh, our expansion and rehabilitation of assets, especially in the rural areas and also in the uh, in the informal settlements. And then we're also seeing some interesting trend from the perspective of operational expenditures. We have seen a dip of revenues, the highest dip ever. And in April, uh, we saw a dip of around 1.1 billion Kenya shillings lost amongst most of our water service providers. Then another trend that we are also seeing is short-term investments uh, for high visibility actions at expense of building resilience. And I think this is the nature of humanitarian response. At the same time, um, it's also an impact from the perspective of, um, of, of politics, because again, water is politics. And most of the time, politicians want to come in to uh, address these issues to support their people. But at the same time, they're coming up with measures that are not sustainable. Drilling boreholes where people can be able to pay for safe water and they're providing this water for free. So what happens in the moment or at the event that uh, we have a breakdown of these uh, systems? So by and large, what we are seeing is that um, COVID-19 has tested the WSP's pandemic response and resilience, and it's also exposing the risks of inadequate wash access in the country. But then at the same time, we're trying to see how we can be able to address the challenge. So basically, we shifted most of our activities and response measures to COVID-19 mitigation measures. So first and foremost, from the humanitarian perspective, we are trying to work with UN-led agencies as well as local government-led agencies. And this is uh, basically from the technical work groups as well as the county wash forums. These are multi-stakeholder forums and here we can be able to have a joint agenda towards uh, um, ad addressing COVID-19 issues. Then at the same time we're trying to see how we can strengthen uh, the, 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 the mandated institutions uh, that are supposed to be supplying safe water. So here we're trying to see how they can be able to improve their service levels especially for rural areas, urban areas and health facilities. And as we do this, we're learning a lot of things. Hadley, move to the next slide. Please move to the next slide. There may be a slight, slight delay in you seeing the slides um, move ahead, but we can see the response programming and pivoting slide now. Okay, then. Uh, so in that regard, uh, we are learning um, a lot of things uh, in the sector when we implement this agenda. So basically, first and foremost, we are learning how to align our programming actions with international community while taking a cross-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach. We are also appreciating the need of data, and not any data, but quality and digitalized data. We're also seeing the need of strengthening this, uh, the civil society groups 
And this is actually to support us on our work in issues to do with evidence-based uh, lobbying and advocacy. And also the private sector, the academia, and the youth have been quite innovative uh, with regards to responding to COVID-19 with various innovations and strategies. So how can we be able to tap in their capacities and be able to do more with less? We are also seeing the high need of being able uh, to, uh, to, to use automated and digitalized systems. And also we are appreciating the fact that a resilient wash system is a product of good governance and political will. Now, I'm going to give you an example of the same from a water utility in Kenya. It's called Kakamega County Water and Sanitation Company. You can refer to their work on Twitter at Kakwasko. So basically what happened in March after, our, uh, after the country uh, was announced to have the first case of COVID-19, we saw a big dip in revenues on April and it went down to around 8 million Kenya shillings. But then at the same time, the company cannot be able to manage the operations and maintenance costs with such a low amount of financing. So in that regard, what they went ahead to do is that um, we supported them on issues to do with um, digitalization of their platforms and actually reaching the customers who are able and uh, willing to pay for safe water to be able to keep the taps flowing. So in this regard, we use the approach of Internet of Things and we maximize on digitalized platforms. Digitalized platforms from the perspective of the payment modes, the complaint systems, the communication uh, platforms as well. So we try to reach out to these customers and this was a whole campaign that was um, participated by CSOs as well as the public health department. So in this regard, uh, from the activities that were done at that moment, um, we have been able to see an increase of revenue collection in June to 16 million Kenya shillings. That's an increase by 50%. But then at the same time, as I was saying that a, a, a good wash system is a product of good governance and political goodwill, we are also seeing how their local government, the county government of Kakamega, it is the first and I think the only government in Kenya that has been able to come through to support or to cushion or to bail out their water service providers. And here they allocated them with a conditional grant of Kenya shillings, uh, 36 million. So we are seeing how systems can be able to respond to this uh, better from that perspective. Then at the same time, while we are seeing the same, we're having a challenge and we're very concerned that yes, water is the first PPE against COVID-19, but then at the same time in our country, the curve has not yet flattened. At the same time, we're also seeing the government has declared that they have insufficient funds for WASH. At the same time, you're seeing disruption in supply chains in terms of the PPEs, in terms of chemicals uh, acquisition, in terms of getting fuel for generators in rural water uh, service providers. So consumers, again, cannot be able to afford their water bills. What happens? if they cannot afford, they'll be disconnected. And once they're disconnected, they will go back to unimproved water sources. And there they will be fighting for water. And that's another issue altogether because it will be an area of transmission of risks. So what again happens, the water burden on the girl child, it's quite daunting. But then again, we were told by the UN chair recently when they were releasing the report on um, on, on SDG 6 and how we can be able to accelerate the same, that we need to build hope uh, in, in our in, in, in the countries and actually the development work through water. And we're trying to do so firstly by partnering with CSOs. And here we're trying to see how we can strengthen their capacities on evidence-based advocacy. We want to have that inclusive perspective of leave no one behind. And this is especially to do with issues to do with citizen engagement and uh, consumer protection at this level, because what is a basic human right? Then secondly, we also are seeing something interesting and uh, actually be to strengthen the CSOs from the perspective of evidence-based lobbying. And this is why data is so important. We want to see how the WSP employees can be considered as frontline workers and not just essential service providers, because once they are considered from that perspective, they can be able to access, um, they can be able to access the COVID-19 and any other emergency response funds. Then at the same time, we want to use the CSOs to see how we can lobby for O&M costs to be reduced to the WSPs. So here in terms of the electricity tariff, what is a basic human right? Our tariffs are not price el uh, elastic. So in that regard, how can we have tariffs that are going to be friendly to and affordable to the 
water service providers. And at the same time, we also want to see how we can have zero rating on chemicals and also suspension of some of these levies and taxes. We also want to see how we can be able to establish strong water systems through strengthening the duty bearers. That's the government as well as the water service providers. And this is, uh, this is we're going to, we, we actually intend to target digitalization and automation of operations in utilities. As you've seen, it's working very well uh, for Kakwasco. Then at the same time, we want to see how we can have credible service level data. And at the same time, see how we can use such digitalized and automation uh, of operations to be able to do the knowledge development and sharing. We also want to see how we can be able to tap into supporting the WSPs on emergency and service business continuity and equity plans. And at the same time, we also want to see how we can be able to enhance uh, water service providers staff safety. Then lastly, we also want to target or to leverage on the private sector and academia roles in SDG 6. Beyond the issues of financing that the private sector can be able to support us on, we have seen that they have been quite innovative. And we want to see how we can be able to tap on the same on issues to do with research and design and innovations and actually just strengthening local capacities to be able to mitigate COVID-19 better. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Euphrasia, for that very thorough uh, presentation. I, we're going to have time to get into more of that in the question and answer period, but uh, great to get uh, uh, to hear words about what's happening on the ground. So really, really appreciate that. Okay, so uh, next uh, we are going to move to Pooja Pandey, uh, who is the Deputy Chief of Party with Helen Keller in Nepal for the Suahara 2 program. Pooja, over to you. Great. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I work as a deputy chief of party for um, the large scale integrated nutrition program, Suhara. Uh, the, uh, the goal of the program is to improve the nutritional status of women and children. Uh, and uh, we have an ambitious target to cover almost 60 percent of the country and directly reach 1.5 million um, women and children with the uh, nutrition interventions. So in my presentation today, I'll talk about um, how a nine-year-old uh, project like Suhara adapted its implementation approaches uh, to support the government of Nepal in national emergency response. Um, so I think the f well, one of the first adaptation we made uh, within a week of lockdown, which was I think around 24th of March, was uh, going completely uh, remote work and going cellular. Um, and I think this massive shift was possible because uh, Suhara, we have a really strong uh, uh, network at the community level. We partner with uh, local NGOs. We also had a really uh, integrated uh, large database where um, demographic information, including um, cell phone numbers of almost 11 million households uh, members uh, were recorded. And so. Uh, post COVID, we uh, lockdown. We are quickly able to uh, make phone calls in this household, identify at at risk uh, uh, population residing in this households, whether they were migrant returnees or pregnant women or households with um, reporting um, lactating women. We were also tracking uh, food insecurity in the households, and um, all these. Um, different subpopulations were linked with the existing uh, community systems for food relief or the migrant workers were referred to quarantine centers, the uh, severely wasted um, children were referred to outpatient therapeutic centers for treatment. Um, we were also able to follow up with more than uh, 35,000 uh, female community health volunteers and health workers to track um, stockouts, uh, to link um, the stockout information with the Ministry of Health and Population, and also address bottlenecks uh, relating to supply so there's, there's continuity of essential services. And um, um, the one thing I want to also highlight is um, how the programs are depending on the emerging needs um, and the context relating to COVID we're quickly able to update a job aid, not only for our frontline workers, but also for the frontline workers uh, for the Ministry of Health. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of operation and programmatic learnings, there were many, and I think one of the major learning I want to highlight is 
the role of digital uh, technologies and communication. Um, it was such a powerful tool to reach millions of uh, and millions of households across Nepal, uh, residing in from urban to rural areas. Um, you know, uh, from the 11 million uh, phone numbers, we were really able to um, identify subpopulation and then tailored uh, SMS uh, messaging. Um, you know, for for pregnant women, there was list certain list of targeted messages sent. For uh, lactation mothers, they were they were really concerned about breastfeeding. So we um, we adapted the messaging communication accordingly. For migrant workers, there was certain set of information we had to provide. So the database really facilitated us to provide tailored uh, uh, messages. Um, and our telephone communication infrastructure also turned out to be a really effective uh, way for women to report uh, domestic violence, uh, which sadly in Nepal has increased um, as a con consequence of log lockdown. And we were able to, again, you know, link this woman with the government uh, helplines and also with the community uh, psychosocial counselors. The other uh, important learning was the digital communication can also uh, be used for a two-way communication with, with the public so one example i have to highlight here is um suhara's um we have a really popular radio weekly radio program called mothers knows the best so um, which was actually now broadcasted through Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and we've sort of adapted uh, in context of COVID, um, added a live component where um, public could uh, uh, ask, directly ask a Q&A session. We also collaborated with a, a national um, online portal where experts were in, uh, invited to address the questions we were receiving on Facebook. So that way we were able to um, understand uh, the public's perspective as well and this has really helped us to dispel rumors um, around COVID-19, uh, talk about stigma openly and also uh, breastfeeding and I'm really happy to report that so far in just in the last two months we've, um, our experts interview has been viewed more than uh, 400 million times. Next slide please. Um, so I think in terms of our greatest, the greatest concern moving forward, uh, we have we share similar concern as many of you, which is the rising food insecurity and malnutrition level in the country. Um, Nepal is such a, even though it's a small country, uh, there are a lot of geographic challenges, uh, and because the supply chain not only of um, health but food system is also broken right now the continuity of basic uh, nutrition health services is a it's a it's a big challenge for us for us because we are a community focused program the safety of our frontline worker is also a, a concern and we're doing everything we can uh, for infection uh, prevention um, measures um, in Nepal a particular concern for us is making sure that the marginalized communities are not left out especially uh, poor and vulnerable group uh, residing in remote areas, uh, areas uh, without radio internet access. Uh, we have a lot of uh, migrant returnees from India. Uh, we have an open border with India, so India and Gulf countries. So how do we sort of involve them? Um, and we're looking at different uh, existing information that's uh, coming up in the country to sharpen our uh, targeting approaches. Um, uh, such as the vulnerable mapping analysis, a nationwide survey was just completed by WFP. Our database also help us to uh, break down uh, data by equity quintile. So really um, looking at where are the hotspots and um, how we can go to the most neediest areas. Um, we're also looking at diversifying uh, behavior change communications work, um, adding more regional local languages to reach more different subpopulation. Um, we're also working hard to bring the, the nutrition services really closer to the community uh, uh, through, you know, empowering mothers for uh, uh, the family MUAC screening, scaling up management of wasting uh, interventions in really remote areas of Nepal, and then building on the mobile applications work we are doing. Uh, and in terms of responding and adapting to the current uh, COVID context, uh, we're also scaling up night. Uh, direct nutrition services, such as intensifying uh, protection and promotion of breastfeeding, um, maintaining 
uh, the continuity of essential health services and really building on the uh, local uh, working with the local government to build the uh, local health and food systems in Nepal. Thank you very much. Pooja, that was great. Really appreciate the insights on how you're adapting everything from behavioral change messaging to outreach to targeting. It's really interesting. Uh, Nepal had experienced a huge shock in an earthquake a few years ago, and now another huge shock. I think some questions are coming in on the chat that highlight the point that we need to be thinking about shock responsive programming for everything we do. We can no longer write in the assumption column, no shock will occur during the implementation period. And there's some other things coming in on the chat uh, in the Q&A, uh, thinking about how we build back better. So I hope we'll have a chance to discuss that uh, towards the end of the call. But now I'm very happy uh, to have with us Mohammed Nurul Amin, who is the chief of party for the Feed the Future Bangladesh Livestock Production and Improved Nutrition Program with ACDI Avoca. He's also the ACDI Avoca country representative. Siddiqui, over to you. Siddiqui, we are not hearing you. Will you double check if your microphone is unmuted? Your audio is not coming through for us. Hmm. Okay. I'm still not hearing you. Although it looks as though your microphone is muted. Try one more time. Hmm. No, that is strange. I'm. Let's see. We'll see what we can do here. Um, but you're, I'm sorry that your audio is not coming through at the moment. I'm checking in with our our tech team here. Apologies, everyone. Please stand by. All right. I think, Greg, what we might do is uh, move the order to cover Wendy's portion and then see if we can get back to Siddiqui. I think that sounds great. Um, and hopefully we can get that audio issue uh, solved. Just to confirm, can people hear me? I can hear great. you, Greg. Yes. Awesome. And I see Wendy. I could see Wendy and hopefully her audio is working, but uh, very pleased to be able to introduce Wendy Bevins, who's a resilience technical advisor with Chorus International. Wendy, thrilled to have you here. Um, and thanks for jumping up in the queue here. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Greg. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so I am the resilience technical advisor with Chorus International, which is an ensemble of faith based organizations, one of which is Lutheran World Relief. And so today I'm going to talk about Lutheran World Relief's Transboundary Resilience Program. This program is located in along two rivers uh, that start in the Himalayas, flow, flow through the Terai in southern Nepal and into Bihar State in India. Um, our team of LWR staff are led by Narayan Gayawali and have been working with local partners in both countries since 2013. Um, over that seven year period, we've had about five phases of this program, um, including where we um, developed a model, which we call the six pillars of a transboundary flood resilient community. I don't have time today to go through all six pillars. But I'm going to highlight the two that are most important. For Hi, the Wendy, program. sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we are getting your audio. But could you speak up a little bit so that everybody can hear you? We're having a little bit of a uh, not oh. perfect audio, so please speak up. Is this better? Is it better? Yeah, that's that? that's great. Thanks, Wendy. Sorry to intrude. Yeah, no, no, no. thanks, Greg. Um, sorry about that. So six pillars. We have a, a model called the Six Pillars of a Transboundary Flood Resilient Community. Um, I don't have time to go through all six pillars, but I can talk about the two that are most relevant for our COVID pivot from flood to COVID response. Um, one of them is the Community-Based Disaster Risk Reduction Institutions, and specifically our Community Disaster Management Committees. 
um, some of which already existed and we kind of reinvigorated and some of which we created from scratch. These are basically local communities that help um, local committees that help communities prepare and coordinate ahead of a flood and during the actual event of a flood they provide early warning communication, search and rescue, first aid, um, sort of your typical DRR response. Um, in order to pivot to COVID, the CDMCs were kind of repurposed and the members were trained with information about COVID which was consistent with national government communications. Another pillar of our work is safety nets um, and in terms of floods we were typically thinking about insurance and loans but in the case of COVID what was particularly relevant was our grain and seed banks. Um, our partners were able to distribute seeds and um, some cash from emergency funds to help the most vulnerable households as access to markets has been lowered and supply chains for agricultural inputs have been um, halted or, or inconsistent. Next slide please. Um, like the other two projects that have been presented already, um, we faced a lot of challenges, particularly around social distancing. And one of the solutions we found to that was really empowering our local staff to make sure they felt safe. They had the authority to adapt programming in the way that made sense to them um, without having to wait for permission from someone else. Um, we have been able to adapt the communication system that was developed for weather stations um, to also provide health messaging around COVID-19, um, which has been really helpful in terms of prevention and updating people um, on what's going on, how things are changing. Um, we're also adapting this system to provide some basic support for good ag agricultural practices. As both Greg and Pooja mentioned, um, there are a lot of people returning from migration, either from other countries or large cities. Um, they're in situations where they need to be able to sustain themselves with farming instead of with wage labor or remittances, and so we're trying to support them. Um, we're also enhancing our digital capabilities to work with lead farmers, um, making sure that they are supported to provide the information to carry out the activities that they can, um, that they can ask questions, and they can share monitoring data as they collect it. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to go in every bullet here, but um, the monsoon season has begun. Um, there's actually already been a really serious flood along one of the rivers where we work um, in the last couple of weeks, and the CDMCs were activated and did their, their DRR work, including providing search and rescue. Um, but the combination of more people in rural areas than normal and the fact that the local authorities are simultaneously trying to handle so many other crises has really put a lot of pressure on local human and financial resources, um, which I think kind of builds up to what everyone is experiencing worldwide. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty, and that creates both hope and fear. Um, in terms of fear, we are doing our best to provide clear messaging to dispel rumors and to, um, to just reduce fear related to the actual disease um, and, and rumors around economic lockdown. Um, but we're also trying to tap into hope, especially through our CDMCs. Um, our first and greatest priority right now and for the foreseeable future is to support the Community Disaster Management Committees to the best of our ability and the local partners who backstop them because they are the ones really delivering for these communities. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, very much. Um, we are having a little bit of audio issues, so as uh, Deke, I hope, has uh, been able to rejoin us. Deke, are you there? Hopefully on audio. Can you uh, hear me, Greg? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Sorry for the tech issues, and now I can see you. Want to test the audio one more time? Yeah, um, I know I've now switched uh, to my phone, so hopefully that works. We hear you loud and clear, Sadiq, so over to you. Thanks for your flexibility. No worries. Uh, thanks, Craig, and um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I was about to start um, talking about um, our activity um, 
the Feed the Future uh, Livestock Production for Improved Nutrition. And um, the key components we are working with uh, livestock productivity, access to um, rural households for hygienic, diverse, and quality food, and also nutrition awareness um, and behavior change and practices. Um, our activity engages um, a lot of private sectors, um, livestock related service provider networks and uh, also government livestock offices to make livestock service available to the farming communities. Um, the activity promotes uh, improved nutrition behavior through um, campaigns targeting over 172,000 um, cattle owning households uh, across um, eight districts of the southwest Bangladesh. Um, so like many other you know, places around the world, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly impacted the 16 billion US dollar, US dollar meat and dairy uh, sector in Bangladesh. Uh, the financial loss of dairy farmers was estimated to be $5 million per day um, in April, um, uh, according to an internet uh, integrated dairy research network uh, economic analysis, uh, cost of milk production increased by 19%, whereas farm get milk price um, decreased um, by um, much. And then the situation analysis conducted by the activity showed that the average enterprise survival rate was 60 days, and they experienced a 42% decrease in sales. Um, the participating farmers we, we are working with, 70% of them um, has witnessed decreased income from milk sales and um, average milk production uh, also went down by uh, 31%. Um, so since March, the activity has been supporting small food and, and livestock markets uh, so that sales of uh, milk and market, meat market uh, can occur in a manner um, I mean, they can resume, but also occur in a manner that reduces COVID-19 transmission risk for um, a lot of market actors and consumers. Obviously, Bangladesh is a very densely populated country, so um, the risks is certainly very high. And um, over uh, the period, we are able to uh, help um, near about 500 small livestock businesses um, to resume their operation. And in one, in one instance, the activity facilitation resulted in business collaboration between an, an online food service delivery platforms and uh, 44 local dairy processors who were who are very unfamiliar um, at that stage with any in an online service delivery platform. And the business is such that the clients would like to um, have that customer experience right in the shop, and uh, so they were all habituated to sell directly to the to the shops. Um, and um, within two months, um, many of the enterprises saw increase in their sales, and they were able to um, recover their losses to a to a great extent. Now, the some of the key learning that we had from from this um, experience is that. Uh, yes, the pivoting business model was one of the um, immediate response strategy for these enterprises. Uh, even under lockdown situations, the, the processors responded to the requirement of, um, of the platform, such as subscription, product profiling, pricing. And then many processors were also able to purchase then uh, a significant amount of milk. And um, uh, in, in only in, a, in the month of May, they're able to um, uh, entertain um, close to 10,000 online orders um, with a total sale of over $25,000. But the reality and, and uh, the lesson, hard lesson that we have also learned that um, um, you know, pivoting needs to be coupled with promotional and other activities to see, sustain those changes. And uh, there is a regular effort that is required in monitoring enterprise performances, trends, and, and a lot of different analyses, such as whether they are recovering the loss, uh, whether there is a shift in terms of the sales patterns, 
um, changes in in the in the product nature and and by uh, by, by all means um, change and and respond quickly to that market needs. Next slide, please. So the, so the concerns is still that pivoting is not the only means to sustain and uh, uh, the, that initial growth affects the confidence of, of a lot of actors who are already in a, in a very challenging situation. So many of the processors were also not able to increase their sales in, uh, and were frustrated. And uh, um, by the fact that a lot of local consumers um, um, we're also not being able to buy dairy products on a regular basis is a challenge as well. Uh, the uncertain nature of the imposed restrictions in different places, in different times, um, is continuing to affect the, 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 their business performances. So um, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the way forward that our program has taken is that um, the, the diversified, we need to diversify the different channels and in order to reduce the risks for the participating farmers and then, you know, the supply chain actors and so on. So we are targeting both formal and informal markets, uh, both large and small dairies uh, to support stable um, supply options for smallholders. Um, there, there are performance gaps that we took into consideration to um, initiate remote uh, capacity building initiatives for many of those local processors and small businesses. Some of the processors has also tried new products in order to uh, utilize some of the surplus or unsold milk and uh, now they have seen they're, they're seeing interest in, in improving the product quality and, and market promotion. And um, we are also assessing the, the risk and, and the risk management perspective of, of such a platform which is very new to, to this kind of um, private sector partners. Um, and uh, and our, our goal is to, is to see that, you know, how um, uh, these risks um, affect them. So, for example, an online business necessarily often don't see commodities differently or doesn't often um, um, in a kind of develop their cost structures or commission structure based on what kind of businesses they are or exactly how the food product or the cost of that product. So we're looking into this kind of options and uh, uh, looking to um, further support um, the, um, the, the participants of our program. Thank you everyone and back to you Greg. Great, thanks Siddiqui and I actually ask you to stay on because uh, as we transition into the Q&A period, I'm going to start with a question for you. But first, uh, I, we can do a virtual round of applause for all the wonderful panelists and presentations. Great examples of adaptive uh, programming and very thoughtful innovation happening. Um, is my audio okay, chat box? Uh, your audio sounds better now. Yes, Greg. Great. I was competing with my 10-year-old who's in a summer program online, so <laughs> forgive me for that. Um, so, Siddiqui, uh, following up on your presentation, how are you supporting women-owned and women-led food and agricultural businesses, those small and medium-sized uh, enterprises that I mentioned earlier, that have been impacted by COVID-19? So a specific question was submitted in the RSVP around um, women-owned businesses. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. Yeah, interestingly, this um, shifts of um, in the ICT platforms um, opens up um, opportunities for uh, both small and large businesses. And um, oftentimes, what we have seen that you know a collaboration um, with a number of different partners really helps us to address um, more of such. Um, uh, Gender-related um, uh, issues. Um, so, in in one one instance, we were working with the Department of Livestock Service, um, who were encouraging people to um, come up and uh, communicate them in terms of their surplus products. So, if in certain restrictions um, the supply chain was closed down for many weeks. But then um, they were um, looking for interested entrepreneurs 
who want to sell their product through um, different promotions. And there was a lot of local promotions um, with those surplus product accumulated um, by, the, um, uh, by the Department of Livestock Service. And uh, in many cases, um, I think we also were able to help them um, with, um, as I said, product um, profiling um, and also um, their promotional um, sort of issues. So these are some of the examples that we have seen from, from our activity. Greg? Great, thank you, Siddiqui. Appreciate uh, those insights. Uh, and those activities. Euphrasia, I'm going to uh, pose a question to you. Um, you know, very interesting presentation you gave on Kiwash in Kenya. And the question is, how can USAID address water insecurity and work to solve water challenges that require complex solutions in emergencies with short timelines while still prioritizing the longer-term needs in the water sector that you outlined? Are there things to be avoided, perhaps opportunities for synergies here to leverage emergency response for development gains? Love if you could speak to that, Euphrasia. Yeah, uh, sure, Greg. Uh, it's quite a good question indeed, because in 2017, a report by Global Water Leaders indicated that apparently we are losing around $323 billion dollars on bad wash in a sector that is already dingling in terms of donor funding. So we need to see how we can be able to ensure that all our response activities and agenda or programming uh, ensure some value for money. But the question is how? So firstly, I feel like uh, we need to appreciate that some emergency issues are unprecedented, like COVID-19, so we can never be adequately prepared. And at the same time, we also need to appreciate that one size fit all approach may fail spectacularly if we take it up or if we adapt them. Therefore, uh, I feel like um, it's important for us to embrace SDG 16 and 17 in all our programming, particularly under SDG 17, I will talk about leveraging of capacities of the private sector in terms of innovations, because most of the time we are targeting the issues to do with financing. But innovations wise is something that probably we need to tap into as well. We have seen they have been quite innovative during this uh, period. Then at the same time, we need to cushion this two agenda in terms of the SDG 16 and and 17. Um, actually, you said needs to cushion both of them so that you can strengthen duty bearers uh, to establish strong water systems. And this is mainly through good water governance. And this will support them to be resilient during pandemics and emergencies. And this also includes issues to do with integrity, because for me, from where I'm seated, I feel like the biggest scandals and corruption cases that are going to be coming, uh, coming up globally is going to be on issues to do with emergency procurement. Then uh, thirdly, um, I, I would also request on issues to do with adoption and scaling up the, of digitalization of data and information sharing as well as messaging. A lot of people have been doing the print media, but with such pandemics, they've been able to see how digitalized uh, information sharing is quite uh, pertinent, as well as supporting utilities and any other institutions to automate their processes. It helps them a lot. Um, uh, um, again, I would also highlight issues to do with data. Uh, with the most recently released a report from SDG 6 Acceleration Framework by UN, uh, we have seen how they have really affirmed the issues to do with data and quality data. And it's because for me, I feel like data is the new deal. Combustion amendments, issues to do with lobbying for increased public finance in the wash sector. And uh, by and large, I feel like Africa, we are not... We are coming from so far and we are moving so little in terms of wash coverage because we are not we are not counting. And you see, it's usually said that you cannot make you cannot change what you don't measure and you cannot measure what you don't know. So we really need to know what you're trying to change. And we need that that, that right. data like yesterday. Then lastly, I would say continue decolonizing the wash sector programming, continue using local capacities. This is what is going to ensure that our systems remain sustainable. Even even when the donors leave the scene. Thank you. That's great, Euphrasia. There's some great points there. Opportunities to leapfrog technology, digital uh, opportunities to work through and build capacity because if we work around local capacity, we undermine it. 
there's some great points there, even the point about opportunists uh, in times like this. So I really appreciate the insights. Pooja, I'm now going to pose a question to you. Uh, what food and nutrition security interventions do you believe will accelerate recovery where you're working in Nepal? Uh, Pooja, are you with us? Can you hear me, Greg? Hello? Loud and clear. Okay, um, I was just saying because nutrition is a multisectoral issue, we need a multisectoral response. And um, I think in uh, terms of Nepal, if you look at the key drivers of malnutrition, it varies by different sub population and sub sub national level. So looking at um, you know certain uh, sub national level has certain drivers. For example, in food insecure districts, we need a different set of interventions. In districts that are food secure but wash or health is an issue, we need to intensify. So I think uh, we need to address all the key drivers of nutrition, but how we do it, who we target, what we prioritize is going to be very critical in this context. Um, I would say you know, really looking at strengthening equity, access, and quality of services from a health system, food system side, but also working on the demand side of services at the local level is going to be very critical in Nepal, um, intensifying, you know, the direct nutrition intervention, especially promotion and protection of breastfeeding, monitoring of the, um, the BMS uh, Breast Milk Substitute Act, you know, early identification of uh, SAM and MAM children so that they uh, get um, Im immediate treatment, um, from a um, food aspect, I think, again, I, I, I keep going back to sharpening uh, your targeting approach to really reach the marginalized communities and households and modifying support for women farmers. Um, you know, mig a lot of migrants workers have returned back, so um, the support could be modified for thinking from an input perspective, services, transportation of the local goods, setting up these collection centers. And also, I think partnership is going to be so critical moving forward. Um, so we're looking at, uh, you know, we overlap with uh, the Feed the Future project, Hisan 2 project, in almost 50% uh, of the areas we work. So really looking at uh, how can we work really together uh, to build, you know, the economic resilience. So we are thinking really from Suhara, we're thinking from garden to plate to market, but really at a local level and through strategic partnerships. Thanks, Greg. Great, Pooja. Those are some, some, some great insights. And I think I take to heart very much, we, we put out big numbers, we put out uh, graphics that describe all the impact pathways, but this is impacting differently in different communities. And you made a really important point there. Although it's impacting everyone, it's impacting some people uh, in a more detrimental way. And this really underscores the importance of inclusive development, uh, focusing on women and, and, and others that, that may be bearing the brunt of these shocks. And we know that when you do focus on women, women-owned businesses, incomes in the hands of women, that that impacts nutrition in a different way as well. So all those important uh, thoughts that you put on the table there, really appreciate that. Wendy, uh, a question for you. Uh, how can we continue to build connections between humanitarian response uh, and programs and development programs during this time? We've done a lot of work over the years in areas of recurrent crisis, learning how to do this, but we'd love to get your insights on how we can use these moments of crisis to advance the integration of humanitarian development response. Over to you, Wendy. Hi, Greg. Um, yeah, I... Several thoughts on that. Um, I do think that USAID's um, focus on this R3 and, and trying to systematize um, the way we think about response and, and that it's a progression, it's not a one-time thing and you walk away, I think that's a great start. Um, I would echo some of the things that other presenters have said around localization and really sustaining commitments under the grand bargain, making sure that um, I mean, local actors really are the best place to respond in the time of crisis. And so if they're embedded in long term planning in their local area, they can make really good informed decisions about building back better in ways that INGOs and donors just can't even access. Um, I've really been um, impressed and, and influenced by USAID's initiative around stopping a success has been examining the way that local entities and INGO partners um, have successful ends 
fiscal exit strategy so that at the end the local entity is able to carry out um, to carry out the services or the programming without support from external actors. Um, and I think digging into that uh, library of resources would do us all a lot of good, um, both in turn in kind of blue sky times and in 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 moments of disaster. Um, I also think some of the the thinking baked into resilience is really helpful. Um, I'm thinking more and more in terms of our TBR project, but also as a, from a global perspective of our full resilience portfolio, we talk a lot about shocks, but stressors are equally important and perhaps more important because they sort of wear out the, the financial and human ability to deal with shocks when they come. And so I think we're getting at that a lot with some of the supply chain discussion, um, inclusion, the the role of justice, and the fact that perpetuate perpet, um, perpetuating injustice happens all the time, and that like tears down people's ability to handle these stressors. In addition to facing shocks when they come, um, the last point I would make would be around local advocacy and making sure that we are really enabling inclusivity in ways that local and national governments hear from the people who are most affected. Great, Wendy. Thanks for those uh, comments and insights. I do think. Um, it really, we've got to understand that building the capacity, the local capacity to respond to shock events, to respond early, is a development responsibility, is a long-term investment. And so for too long, we consider that as sort of baggage that the humanitarian side also had to carry. But in fact, uh, through our work on resilience and, and our partnerships, we've been really beginning to focus on building local capacity to respond because there's two ways you can actually reduce the need for external intervention. One is build the capacity in communities, but others is build local capacity to respond to shock events that overwhelm the capacity of households and communities to manage on their own, whether it's drought response, insurance programs, et cetera. I think that um, the series of impacts related to COVID-19 have uh, put a spotlight on all the seams in the current system uh, that really suggests we need to double down on building local capacity, et cetera. Um, and I, I really think that, um, you know, the learning we're doing in this moment, the opportunities to leapfrog forward on some of these things around digital, the need to double down on local capacity, these are all great points. Um, we're getting towards the end of the panel, and um, I've been noting uh, some of the questions coming in through the Q&A. Uh, a fantastic set of questions. So after the event, we will get together and, and pull together uh, frequently asked question uh, responses to these, because we don't want these questions to go unanswered. But I did want to just take a moment before I pass back to Julie and respond to one question, because there's a lot of technical questions, a lot of very specific questions about poultry and the role of building back incomes, et cetera. But there's a bigger question that was posed here, and it's actually the central question. And it, it is, is not COVID also about looking forward to a sustainable world as opposed to only preserving the gains of the past? So we talked about backsliding on progress, et cetera. But I think that question hits the nail on the head. If an event like this can't allow us to backslide on progress, what does that make us think about how we need to be thinking differently about building a new future, a new sustainable future in which shocks and stresses are not anomalies, but perennial uh, features of our landscape? And so I think that question, it's a huge question. Um, there's a lot of uh, unanswered aspects of that question, but this isn't about building back to the point of vulnerability we were when COVID hit. It's about building a sustainable future that really takes account of the fact that whether it's COVID-19, whether it's large-scale droughts, whether it's conflict, whether it's other shocks and stressors, these are accelerating in intensity and frequency, and we will only be successful as a community if we work with local actors, local communities to build their capacity to withstand these shocks and stresses as they make progress on their journeys to self-reliance. So I am going to thank our panelists, Euphrasia, Pooja, uh, Siddiqui, Wendy, great presentations, uh, great answers in the question and answer. Wish we could have been together uh, in a room somewhere having this conversation. 
that even we're doing a little bit of leapfrogging um, with the technology, forced leapfrogging. And I think despite some of the audio and other challenges today, uh, we're doing pretty good and really appreciate the opportunity on my side to pull this community together, to pull these insights. And I think one of the fundamentally important roles we can play as USAID is enabling this peer-to-peer -peer learning. So we had four folks here, but we're gonna to continue to ask for you guys to submit your stories and your learning so we can facilitate learning from one another. We've got to come together. If ever there was a need for collective action, this is it. Julie, back over to you. Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you to our panel. We have a few closing remarks, but before we do, I wanted to highlight that we also have a poll question that we're going to go ahead and publish. Uh, you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a little bubble uh, that looks like a, a poll question and um, asks which topic you would like us to discuss in our next community meeting. So please take a moment to answer that for us. All right, I would like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker to provide some brief ref reflections on the panel. Max Primorak, who is the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and the alter ego for the Assistant to the Administrator. Max? Thanks, Julie. Can you hear and see me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, I want to thank uh, our panelists and, and Greg Collins for uh, an extraordinary conversation uh, was very sobering for me and uh, I've learned quite a bit. Uh, thank you also to all of you on the webinar and I want to echo Greg uh, for those of you who submitted questions uh, for our panelists to answer. Uh, this has enriched uh, the conversation. Uh, I've really learned a lot just by uh, reviewing them my myself. And definitely this is a, a critical uh, discussion. It is clear that the COVID-19 pandemic is a multi-dimensional crisis, as many have uh, noted, that requires a coordinated and strategic response. The pandemic is a humanitarian crisis with life-threatening needs impacting communities all over the world right now. The U.S. government has provided $558 million in humanitarian assistance to meet these immediate needs. In the humanitarian space, USAID has provided $184 million in food assistance, Four and a half million in nutrition and 115 million in wash. Our strategy has focused on preventing, preparing for, and responding to COVID-19 in existing complex emergency responses and addressing potential humanitarian consequences of the pandemic. But as you all know, the impacts of COVID-19 will stretch well beyond the immediate humanitarian needs. This pandemic will and is already impacting development gains and disrupting sectors such as food, nutrition, and water security. The numbers are daunting. And as you heard from the panelists, the negative impact from COVID is staggering. As we've heard, this cannot be solely a humanitarian response. Humanitarian and development actors must work together to address this pandemic and prevent a worsening crisis. This is a response that requires a long-term response in the development space and an immediate response from the humanitarian community. This is at the forefront of our thinking here at USAID. We committed to providing humanitarian assistance to respond to the immediate needs in this response, and we are integrated COVID considerations into our longer-term programming, as you've heard this morning. In addition, the USAID R3 transformation built a structure for USAID to continue integrating our humanitarian and development work with BHA and RFS, continuing and expanding upon our years of collaboration. To conclude, the COVID-19 pandemic will reverberate through humanitarian and development assistance for years to come, and our collective work in this space is likely just the beginning. I'm going to hand it over now to Maura for closing thoughts. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Over. Thank you, Max. And last up, we have Maura Berry, Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Resilience, Resilience and Food Security and Alter Ego for the Assistant to the Administrator. Maura, I'll leave it to you to close out. Great. Thanks, Julie. And thank you, Max. Uh, just confirming you can all see and hear me. Yes, you sound great. Fantastic. So I have the great pleasure of uh, closing out, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and thank you to our speakers and to our panelists, and 
I know that there's a lot of competing webinars out there these days. So the fact that over 700 of uh, participants joined is really impressive to see. I hope that you found this meeting helpful, particularly with regards to understanding the importance of bridging that gap between humanitarian and development assistance. Um, as you're well aware, we've done a lot over the last decade to strengthen those linkages to our all of agency efforts to build resilience in areas of recurrent humanitarian crises. And though the data on COVID-19's impact is very sobering and unfortunately anticipated to persist in many regions for years to come, we're really confident that USAID's new R3 family structure sets up sets us all up to better support vulnerable communities during the current pandemic and well beyond. So I know for us today's session was super helpful and extremely worthwhile. And I want to emphasize how much USAID values um, sustained engagement with all of you. And to that end, I want to leave you with something, which is an exciting new learning platform that USAID has, which will allow us um, to work with you, our stakeholders, and uh, share learning and data and impacts and reports on COVID-19. So this will enable us all to continue to learn more about the evolving impact of the pandemic. And you'll see the link that's here up on the screen. So we encourage you um, to be learning from your colleagues, from your peers, to share with us. Um, and also let you know that um, up on our website, you'll find other resources on COVID-19, such as further guidance and fact sheets. And with that, I say again, thank you and close out the meeting.